And you may think, well, you know, has anything good come from Patterson? My wife. Yes. <laughs> so I have a, uh, a very grateful attitude towards the Silk City. Um, it actually does tie into what I want to say today. So I'm going to just kind of launch here into the scriptures and what the Lord asked me to share and what he's been showing me. I'm calling it the quantum power of kingdom connection. And it's based on Hebrews 10, 24. Uh, two verses from Hebrews kind of sets it up. Hebrews 10, 24 in the Berean Study Bible says, and let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Could you say that? Spur one another on? You know, the word spur would come from a cowboy who has spurs on his boots and uh, he's trying to get the horse to move a little faster. We're not talking about literally doing this, but we're talking about encouraging one another, right? Spur one another on to love and good deeds. And then in the King James, the next verse says forsaking, I'm sorry, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And having just lived through three years plus of COVID and, and all the things that happened during those three years, it certainly highlighted to me how important it is that we gather. But also this idea of assembly, and I've said it before, but I just wanted to dig a little deeper and it's getting cold, uh, just so you guys know, they're, they're putting their coats on. <laughs> so you might wanna warm it up a little. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I, I'm picking up on the body language, even though I'm sweating. <laughs> Oh, well, too bad for me. <laughs> That's why I got my little fan here. So we gather together so we can freeze. No, just kidding. <laughs> we gather together because there's power. One puts 1,000 to flight, it says in the word. Two put 10,000 to flight. So that's worth meditating on. And this idea of quantum, I'm not a scientist, as you probably have figured out. Um, but we have a couple in our church for sure that I talk to and, and trust to make sure that I'm not making, you know, incorrect assumptions about when I make an analogy to something. And has anybody heard of quantum computing? It's, it's kind of relatively new, but, you know, you might know about it. I certainly know about it being in the investment business because whoever kind of gets there first with this new technology is going to have a big advantage because the, the best current way of computing these new quantum computers are a million times faster and have more capacity. So just to give you an idea, like it's, it's something that could be used for good and like anything else, could be used for bad. But when I say quantum, I'm talking about a leap, right? You've heard of quantum leap, that's another way. You might hear it, it's, it's, it's a large measure of change above and beyond the normal thing that you might expect. And that's who we serve, a quantum God. And, and there's power that's above and beyond the normal power. When we assemble together, it's not just me being a lone ranger out there. It's, it's important that we have our individual relationship with God, but over and over again in scripture, it talks about how we can spur one another on to love and good works and not forsake the assembly together because when we get isolated, we can get picked off by the enemy. And we don't wanna do that. And then it says in Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are assembled in my name, that's a complete Jewish Bible, where two or three sometimes would say gathered in my name, but assembled keeps pointing us to, no, we're, we're interconnected with each other. We're assembled together, and it's up to us to overcome differences. I love the fact that we have a very diverse church age-wise, ethnically, a bunch of different things that isn't necessarily a given. Fair? Yes. Well, look around. It's a beautiful bride of Christ. Yes. Balcony too. Love you all up there. And uh, this is what heaven's going to look like. Yes. Right? Yes. Multicolors. Multi-ages. Beauty in so many different ways. And thank God that we have that. Thank God that we can blend together and become the body of Christ that is representative of so many different parts of our, of our society. Or wherever two or three are assembled in my name, I am there with you. And Zoom is phenomenal. Believe me when I tell you, I'm, I'm grateful for that tool. But they could be wearing their pajama bottoms and you don't know it. <laughs> so there's something about being in person that's a little different than Zoom. Okay? Nothing wrong with it. I use it almost every day for work. I get it. But, like, it's really good to be together. 
you know, I'd like having people lay hands on me to pray for me. I don't want it to be on the screen. <laughs> There's something about worshiping together and just what happens in a room like this when we all worship together. So that's going to be the focus today. But I also want to tie it to this idea in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. It says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Anybody not heard that scripture? I guess most of us have if you've been a Christian any length of time. That's a very big warning, isn't it? Because I would say in my study, when we were born, we were automatically yoked to the world because we were born with a sin nature. We needed a savior. We had to be redeemed. We couldn't save ourselves. And the old famous line, well, I'm not such a bad person. That's true. I, you know, I don't doubt that until they do a 60 minute special on you or something, but <laughs> busted. No, but I get it. Most of us are not doing things that would put us in jail, but that's not what this is about. It's about being born into a sinful world and we can't save ourselves. So it's really valuable to be around other Christians but not just around them, but connected to them. Some will, will benefit you by being able to give you some of their wisdom, and other times you'll be able to give them wisdom. So it should be two, a two-way street. And there's also safety, right, because there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And you're probably not going to be friends with every single person in the church. We get that. And you might not even like every single person in the church. So be careful when you see them in the... Thank you, Nate. I pay him a lot of money to do that, you know that. <laughs> Best smile in the world right there. You know, like, first time I met my wife was in the parking lot at church, and it didn't go well. But I caught her in a moment of weakness later, and uh, I wore her down. <laughs> so the point is, we're in this thing together, and if we don't value each other, we're missing some of that quantum power that could happen. And it's not easy to like somebody who's very different than you. Because we tend to just, you know, human nature is, wow, that person agrees with me all the time. They're great. <laughs> right? But maybe you need to hear some other viewpoints, too. And we found out again through COVID that our immune system only gets stronger when it gets tested. That's, that's how our walk with the Lord is. We need to know where we stand on these different issues. How long will you waver between two opinions? I said in the Old Testament, right? No, we want to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But the enemy wants us to get us distracted. So being together has so many different values that are intangible, but there's also this very tangible value that by being yoked together with you all, I'm not yoking myself to the world. I mean, you might say, well, you know, I been working on in finance in New York City for a long time. I worked for different companies. If I'm an employee of a big firm, am I yoked to them? I would say no, and that could be an easy question to ask. But if you're in partnership with somebody in a business, then you're liable for the decisions that they make. And if they're not a Christian, they're going to make very decision, different decisions than you are. So be careful. That's all I'm saying. Be careful. And if we apply this to relationships and marriage, I'm sure you know enough war stories there of somebody who was dating someone who wasn't a Christian, praying that they would evangelize them after the wedding. <laughs> Anybody think that's a good idea? <laughs> Not a lot of hands going up. Possible, anything's possible with God. Um, that'll be another marriage conference that we'll talk about that, but we gotta be careful who we're yoked with and to. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And that was because there were many farmers in his day where they were, that was, it was an agrarian kind of community, and they knew what it meant to have an oxen and a younger oxen, and they would yoke up the younger oxen with the older oxen to train them what to do on how to work. And he said, well, you know, the world's, world's yoke is going to drag you down really fast, but if you let go of that and you yoke yourself up to me, including in the form of the other believers that are all around you, you can learn from everybody. Sometimes you're helping them learn something too, but by interacting with each other, keeping an open heart and being willing to, to live life together and, and walk through life together, we are so much better off as a body of believers. So we'll keep going a little further here because I love this picture of how in the, uh, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, 
it says that Jesus went into the synagogue and there was a woman there who had been bent over for 18 years, but it was on the Sabbath. So they were, there was tension in the air if Jesus was going to commit a sin by performing a healing on the Sabbath because the religious people considered that work. Don't get me started on that religious spirit, right? But he ends up saying to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity, and you would also imply spirit of infirmity there. And these Pharisees and Sadducees that were in charge were not happy that he committed a sin in the temple because he performed a healing and they considered that work. And then he says back to them, just like, wait a minute though, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to the water? So ought not this woman be in a daughter of Abraham who Satan has bound? Can you say that? Whom Satan has bound with a spirit of infirmity. So even though it's a physical sickness, the cause of it is a spirit. Anybody experienced people you knew during COVID that were infirm because of fear? That's a spirit. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. Now, there's a, there's a healthy amount of normal fear. You know, don't step off the curb when there's an 18-wheeler coming down the block. That's just being smart. <laughs> So don't do stupid things, and Jesus said that when the enemy tempted him. Don't test God, but walk in faith. So shouldn't this woman, this daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it, 18 years, and I would say be loosed from this yoke to this spirit that has been keeping her bent over and keeping her from the full uh, measure of who God wants her to be? The answer is yes. And you need to realign your algorithm that thinks that's a sin because you don't consider it a sin when you're watering your ox or your donkey. So why isn't this woman more important than your religious rules if she can be healed? Well, because they weren't really praying for healing for anyone. <laughs> that's what legalism does. Then in Octo Isaiah, not October, Isaiah 1027. October's the 10th month. <laughs> So 1027 of Isaiah, the way I learned it in uh, King James Version was, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Yeah. Know that verse? Because we would say it over coffee as the anointing breaks the yoke. And my, my picture of that, just so you could think with me here through this, is that so many different examples, right, when David was playing the harp, and it, it says the anointing on, on the worship music drove the evil spirit out from Saul. Right? The Spirit of God would come on people in the Old Testament, and they would do great exploits, like Samson killed all those people with the jawbone of a donkey, right? So I was picturing as God coming down from the outside and breaking the yoke off, and me saying, thank you, God, for that power that was demonstrated. But now we have to realize that we have Holy Spirit inside of us, and he's also doing something on the inside of us and giving us power. So it's not just down from heaven. It's also doing something to us when we get healed. When that woman stood up, she was not bound by the yoke of that sickness any longer, that spirit of infirmity. But she was also stronger against the next thing that would, the enemy would try to use against her. Because once you're healed, you're not going back into that sickness. When God is in it, there is no limit. Remember that song we used to sing? It's not over. Now, when God is in it, there's no limit. So what about this idea that the power could also be coming up inside of us as he's moving? And maybe it's even that there's another version of this same verse that says, the yoke will be broken because your neck will be too large. <laughs> That's a whole different picture, isn't it? It's not just God coming down with this big sledgehammer and breaking that yoke off. It's him putting so much power in you that you grow on the inside, and that thing that used to hold you back, that woman that was bent over, no, you know what, boom, she gets up. And she's not bound by that yoke anymore. She's not yoked to that spirit of infirmity anymore. Deliverance is like this. We've seen it for 24 years since we've been up here, and I was married to my wife a long time before we came out here too, and I saw over and over and over again the way the enemy was keeping people locked down into addictions or witchcraft often we were coming out of uh, Essex County and there was just a whole bunch of people that that were bound culturally 
by witchcraft, didn't know it, right? The parents didn't even realize how much it was involved in the way they were bringing up their children because it had become so acceptable. And that could be any one of us in here could have been subject to some kind of cultural thing that our family thought was normal. But we have to compare our value system to the scriptures, not to our family. And we might have to let go of some of those things. If they don't line up with scripture, you have to make a decision which one is more important. And I want the blessing of obedience and I want the freedom to be everything that God made me to be. So that's how we can think of this as not just coming down from heaven, but something happening inside of us as that little smaller sphere and moving up and saying, you know what? I'm being lifted by this quantum power of God. It's over and above the natural thing that I can experience on a regular basis. And there's something about being connected with people that helps that happen. It's very hard to put exact finger on it, but scripturally, it's over and over again. It's talked about over and over again including on the downside, because when Jesus wanted to heal somebody, he put people out of the room first. Not to be critical of them, but he knew that whoever was going to be in the battle had to be serious about this. How many people could Gideon have had to go to battle? Thousands and thousands of people. But God said, you know what? I don't want you bringing people who are afraid. I only want the 300 people that you need. Because they weren't afraid. Similarly, it's not to put somebody down. When he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, he didn't take all 12 disciples with them. He took his inner core with him, and Peter even kind of made, you know, a couple of statements there. God had patience with Peter. So now as I move up from my current condition, that yoke is breaking because the power in me is getting stronger, and I'm not going back. I don't want to go back to that grovel anymore now that I've seen what it's like to walk in the fullness of God. Amen? So we get muscle mass of faith. We build our faith because that's, like I said earlier about healing, the biggest obstacle to faith is not fear. It's unbelief. It's not believing that God could really do this. And you know what the enemy is going to say? You've prayed about this for years. Nothing's happened. It doesn't work. That's not God saying that. It's not God saying that. Muscle mass of faith is building yourself up. And this could sound, you know, to some people like legalism. Well, should you memorize scripture? Should you watch uh, certain kinds of movies on, you know, uh, on cable or whatever? Well, you'll, you have to make your own decisions about those things. But if you realize that spiritual warfare is real and that you might not just yet be exactly where God wants you to be, what do you think? Maybe? Then... Those things that might have seemed a little silly, like let's just say Halloween, that would be an example. Oh, you're one of those fanatics, you don't let your kids celebrate Halloween. Well, you know, we let them get together and they dress up as angels. <laughs> you know, like, why not dress them up as angels, but not demons? I don't know, am I missing something? Are we supposed to dress up like demons? Like, I don't know, I don't think so. Give me the chapter and verse on that one. But you look at, oh, you're a fanatic and you shouldn't be doing this. Well, we're offering an alternative to come together and, you know, celebrate. But, you know, if there's a holiday in, in our culture, which there is, that we don't agree with, then, you know, you have to still make the decision for yourself. But we're telling you, probably not. I'm not going to celebrate death. I'm going to celebrate life. I used to celebrate the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I was a deadhead. What a stupid name. Now I'm a lifehead. I celebrate life, not death. <laughs> now, these aren't just physical muscles. As good as those are, it's really healthy to have physical muscles. But these are spiritual muscles. And you don't regress. You get stronger. And you don't want to go back. And you can develop a spiritual immune system. And this is where Lewis Dickens, is, when he's teaching next Saturday, is helping you open your eyes to the discernment that you need to recognize when there's spiritual warfare involved. Because it's often involved. I would say almost always involved in one way or another because we're not wrestling against the person. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but what? Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and the wickedness that lives in that space. And we're very grounded to the earth. We have to be to make a living, right? You have to be good at your job or they won't pay you. But that doesn't mean that you can't bring God into any job that ever existed. Do you believe that Jesus could do your job? And he might have a way to show you how to do your job better than you're doing it right now. The answer is yes. 
Whether you believe it or not, it's just, doesn't, I, I guess it does matter. If I was making pornographic movies, he would not want to show me how to make better movies. So if you're doing that, let's talk after the service because you probably shouldn't be doing that. If you're a hitman for the mob, we should talk. But you said any job, he'll make me better, right? You get it? Okay, good. I don't want you to be a hitman for the mob. <laughs> That's what's called a quantum leap. That's leaving the cesspool of being yoked to the bondage of the world and breaking that thing off because your strength came up on the inside of you and now your eyes are open. I don't need to go back to that. I don't want to go back to that. I had a soul tie with that person. They're destructive to me. That thing's been severed and I'm not going to reconnect it. But I am going to pray that they'll get saved. And it could very well be that the change they see in you is the very thing that helps them come to the Lord. Oh, that's another hole bunch of conversations to have. And then I get, you'd have to say that the greatest example of a quantum leap of all time was Jesus resurrecting from the grave. That's a quantum leap. That's such a difference that he had a different body when he came out. He could walk into the room without going through the door. He could hide himself from people that knew him walking on the road to Emmaus, and it wasn't until he broke the bread that their eyes were open. And he could reveal himself. And I would argue in my study that that is exactly what Adam and Eve had in the garden before sin came. That's what we are going to have when he comes back for the final return. We're going to rule and reign with him forever. And you're going to get a new body. You can't say amen about that. And I don't know. You need to lay hands on me. <laughs> I'm going to skip through that one. So Paul was very good about making this real for us because he uses the body as an example. And he said, your body has many parts, but you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. Through his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. That's the message version. Message version. In one way or another, it was a partial and piecemeal life. Even though you might have been successful in the world's standards, it was still missing redemption. It was still missing forgiveness. They'll say things in the business world like, well, you know, business is business. How stupid it is to say something so obvious, but they don't mean, it's not the obvious thing. They're basically saying, sometimes we have to do things that we know are wrong, but we have to do it. Yeah, it happens all the time. All the time. We're put in these very difficult conundrums. What should I do? Should I take a stand? And the enemy knows this. And as soon as you start to compromise a little, then it starts to get become a bigger compromise, right? We should talk, really, because I've been in the workforce for a long time, and many people have thanked me later, say, well, I didn't think of handling the situation that way. Thank you. Right? You, you start to build muscle memory around this. So he's saying partial and piecemeal was not that you had a terrible life, but you were missing that redemptive piece. How easy is it for people in the world to forgive today? Not easy. Hey, good to see you, Aaron. Welcome back. It's not easy for people to forgive. Cancel culture and forgiveness don't go hand in hand. Or mercy. No mercy. You made a mistake 45 years ago in your yearbook picture. Canceled. What about forgiveness and mercy? We each used to independently call our own shots. <laughs> That's true for me. But, but then we entered into a large and integrated kingdom connection. We're all part of a body, and we're assembled together, and the power of the group is much stronger than the individual power of each part. As good as you might be, you're stronger when you're interconnected in the family, hmm. into which he has the final say. We don't have the final say anymore. He has the final say. Wisdom in a multitude of counsels. Counselors, I'm not sure what to do. Can you pray with me? Yes, happy to do it. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, Jesus' resurrection body. We all have that quantum power to overcome the weaknesses of our flesh. And that picture of me just getting bigger and whatever that yoke was breaking off is a lot better than just waiting for that hammer to come down and break it off. No, Lord, you're going to make me stronger. And that anointing is going to be, uh, the anointing is going to break the yoke off of my life. The old habits that we once used to identify ourselves, no, not habits, labels, sorry. The old labels that we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek or slave or free, 
Today you could say Palestinian or Jew, right? Like it's in the news all the time about identity are no longer useful. We need something larger and more comprehensive to label ourselves because our identity is not our ethnic background. And it's not what we do for a living. Well, tell me about yourself. I'm an accountant. No, that's just what you do for work. Well, I also do stand-up comedy on the side. Most accountants I met don't do stand-up comedy, I can tell you that. No offense to any accountants here. <laughs> what we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size. Woo! What? Each its proper size and in its proper place. So think about this. God loves you so much, he'll take you just the way you are, but he loves you enough to want you to grow. So that whatever anointing is holding you, I'm sorry, whatever yoke is holding you down, as you increase and you grow, that thing gets broken off just as a natural part of the process. You get stronger. You get muscle member. Your immune system gets stronger. You don't fall victim to the, to the, the, the wiles of the enemy because they've been exposed. And you learn that life isn't just about, about natural laws. It's also about spiritual laws. No part is important on its own. That's a humbling verse right there. No part is important on its own. Why? Because if you took the heart out and left it on the sidewalk, what happens to it? It dies. So we all need each other, and we don't like that. <laughs> Sorry, I've been doing this long enough. We don't like that. I only need God. Well, okay, you want to do that, but... That's ignoring assembling together, spurring one another on. If you got it all so together, why don't you come and help some of our people who don't have it so together? No, I'm just waiting for Jesus to get me out of here. He's coming back any minute now. It can't get worse. Yes, it can. <laughs> That's not a negative confession. That's just reality. Read your Bible. It was much worse when the Bible was being written than it is today. I'm going to finish this part. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as the church. Every part dependent on every other part. It's really hard to grasp, you know, because we're such a consumer-minded group of people in our culture. You go and you get something at a store, and if you don't like the value, you go to a different store. You go to a church, and you didn't get something of value, so you go to a different church, and that's fine. Because you should know that, that you're only being fed where you want to be fed, and you have the complete right to do that. But maybe why you're not going there is because it's like they're asking me to do things like fast. I hate fasting. Well, you know, it's in the Bible. <laughs> There's no, like, junior varsity version of doing this. These are important things for a reason. And hopefully, we, if we're going to ask you to do a fast, we tell you why. And we help train you how to do that. But to, to counter the enemy's efforts, we need to take this very seriously. You know, and Dutch Sheets has this wonderful saying, you have to know who to go to lunch with and who to go to war with on your side, not war against, but who's, who's going into war with you because you don't want some halfway watered down person. Fine for lunch, but not war. <laughs> and that's why Jesus said, you two come with me. Tell the other people to wait outside. That's not critical of those other people. They just weren't ready yet for what they were about to do. And we're always, always growing. That's his heart for us. Every part is dependent on every other part. And you might say, well, I'm just here to fill up my notebook and learn more. No, you might be here to pray for somebody else. And you'll get more out of that. And here's just a really interesting thing. i got to keep doing this because the clock is out on the back there. Maybe he wants me to keep going. I don't know. <laughs> of course the pastor would say that. Right? But what about this? And this was fact-checked by somebody that I really trust. Because I had read the quantum leap was what I had always heard of, and I always assumed, you know, these photons are circling around the, the nucleus, and all of a sudden it pops up to another level. Fair? Another orbit level. Like, that would be spiritual growth in the way I was thinking of it. But as I studied it a little bit, there's also, it can go to a lower level, too. Do you know that? So that's a leap in the wrong direction. <laughs> I always thought leap meant go up, but it could go the other way. And what is the determining factor whether it goes up or down? Anybody know? 
He didn't tell me it was going to be a physics class. Is if you absorb more light, you go to a higher level. If you discharge light, you go to a lower level. Ha! Huh. I studied economics, not physics, so I'm not going to go too far on that example. But that makes total sense as a Christian, right? I saw the light. Once I was blind, now I see. I got to a whole other level of my understanding. It doesn't mean we shouldn't discharge in, in the way that we're helping people. What, what Diana just talked about up here is really important because the, the, the quantum kingdom connection isn't just for us. When they go out into the streets of Patterson and they help people for no reason other than the love of God, right? That's what's driving this whole thing. And we've heard from many of the people that we serve food to that the, the reason they come is because we're not shaming anybody. They know it's the love of God that's given this. We're not looking down on them because they need it. But sometimes when they go to the government agency, that's not the sense they feel. And I'm, I'm not blaming everybody out there. There's plenty of great people that work for the government too. But their motive is not love. See, that's why we got that call that day at 4 o'clock on a Friday. Do you have anybody that can deliver this food? Because our people have all left for the day. Fair enough. Of course I'm going to do that. Well, guess what? Not only did we get to bring the guy food, we got to pray with him. And we have been going back every week and bringing him more food. Not because he asked. What would we do? Not, we know the need exists. Well, they didn't call us. The guy's blind. Is he a member of our church? Yes. Of course he is. The fact that he's blind and can't get here doesn't make him any less connected to us. Get it? Good. I'm almost done. Thank you, Nate. That's a quantum fan in the audience. <laughs> Christ Church is a complete body. This gets a little tricky here, yet some of you keep competing for the so-called important parts. Yikes. That is not the Holy Spirit, is it? It's uh, the spirit of, what was the girl's name that did the kneecap job on Nancy Kerrigan? Yeah, everybody knows Tanya Harding. Oh, well, wait a minute. I love the worship team, but somebody here has a better voice than me. So I'm not going to have my identity anymore because I'm going to wait in the parking lot and give her a kneecap job. Because my identity is worship leader, and I have to be the best one. Your identity is child of God. No crowbar needed. <laughs> You're the one who prayed for more people to come on the worship team, but not, not somebody that does my part on. See how dangerous this can be, right? We're not here to compete with each other. We're here to bless each other, wash each other's feet. Not easy, is it? I don't like them. They're not like me. They don't like the same music. They don't like what I like. We always are disagreeing all the time. Well, maybe there's something you can learn from them. No arguments in the parking lot after service, please. <laughs> Ours was before service. <laughs> but now I want to lay out a far better way for you. Whew. So he just goes through this amazing, I didn't give you all the scriptures, but he does this amazing comparison. Well, what if it was just an eye and you had no feet? Or what if it was an arm? Like he uses all these examples, right, of why we need every part of our body. And we automatically go to, yeah, but how come they can take our appendix out? And we're still okay. Because <laughs> we're always trying to, to, to have an excuse or a reason that we don't need each other. Because it's annoying that we need each other. But it's the best thing to help you grow and be connected and assembled. You will learn so much from people when you just have this open-handed uh, uh, attitude towards them. I want to lay out a far better way for you after this whole example. Of, and now he's getting to this part about don't compete with each other. There's a better way. And then the chapter ends, and it goes to another chapter. And the first line of the next chapter says, If I speak with tongues of men and angels but have not love... Then I am just a sounding brass. Remember this one? You hear it at weddings all the time. It's, just, it's the chapter about love. But because we've been trained to read chapter after chapter, we don't always connect the next verse, even though it's exactly in the flow of what he's writing here. 
So clearly there's a better way than competing with each other. It's called in the Greek, even though that was 13.1, it's the next verse, even though we would say in the Greek it's agape love. That's how I pronounce it. I know other people say it differently, but so some... Wait a minute, what does that mean? So here's the deal. We all understand love. John Lennon, I think, was the one that wrote it. All we need is love, right? Well, they, don't, they only know the world's kind of love, and there's lots of different kinds of this, right? But this kind is the, God, is the only kind that you can only get from God. It's a sacrificial love. It's what he did for the, for the disciples in the upper room. And it says that right in John chapter 13. Having come to the end, he loved them to the end. And the first thing that happened after they had the dinner was he knelt down and washed their feet. And he said, I'm leaving you an example that you could do as I have done to you. Can't be in your own power. It can't. It didn't come factory installed when you were born in the hospital. You weren't missing something that should have been there. You can only get God's kind of love by accepting God and inviting him into your heart and taking on his nature. It's the missing ingredient in the cancel culture right now. They're big on justice, but not on mercy. And you know what happens? The, the wheel spins, and now it's going to be their turn to be canceled because they didn't keep up with the latest thing that you were supposed to know. You can't. It keeps changing. But if we live together and we say, you know what? This is my best thinking on it. This is what I see in the Bible. How are you reading that? Let's respect one another. And then we can allow this kind of love to flow through. Quickly, I know the time. God knows, this is what the enemy said to Eve in the garden. God knows the day that you eat from the tree, your eyes will be open. And you will be just like God. And I'm going to say, God can't handle that. That was the argument that the enemy was using against Eve. He knows that if you eat from that tree, the reason he told you not to eat from that tree is because he can't handle you being equal to him. And you will know good and evil. And Satan's like, and that'll be really good for you to know good and evil. You can handle that. Well, if God said I can't, because he did, live in a relationship with me. Don't try to reinvent all the rules on your own. If I said there's a difference between a boy and a girl, there's a good reason for that. A blood test will tell you that, by the way. But if the culture's going to go all the way to that absolute, and if they can get you to question that one, everything else below it, will fall like a domino behind it. The enemy always goes for our identity. God is holding out on you. He can't handle the fact that you could be equal to him. You can handle the knowledge of good of evil. You won't die if you eat from that tree. And that's the root of pride. People are still wrestling with this idea that they don't need God and they can just handle it on their own. I, I learned the hard way. I have enough bumps on my head. I'm not going back there. I know I need God. Hopefully you do too. That's not a sign of weakness. That's called wisdom. <laughs> it didn't take long. Tower of Babel. They said, come, let us, what? Build ourselves a city. See what happens? We don't need God anymore. Let's just build ourselves a city. And a tower whose top is up in the heavens. Because that's where he thinks he is. We'll just do it on our own. And let us make a name for ourselves. Not child of God. We're just going to do it ourselves. And then you get this Acts chapter 2. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What? Why? Well, look, it says, reversing the curse of Babel. God confused their language so it would make it harder for them to rebel against him. But now God is saying in the New Testament, because my son came and died but didn't just die, resurrected, and didn't just resurrect, but then brought his blood to the mercy seat in heaven. And that didn't end it either, because then I was able to release Holy Spirit, and now every one of you has the power that Jesus had when he was here, which is why he said, it's good if I leave. And then he ascended and sat down at the right hand of the Father, and if you remember Isaac Petrie, he was sitting right about here, and he said, you are seated right next to him. But he wasn't standing. He was sitting to make the point. And we forget that, that we are seated in heavenly places. But I'll take it back to just this connection piece. It says, they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it 
that we each hear in our own language, I mean, right down to the dialect which, in which we were born. Why would God give them the ability to speak to somebody else in a language that they never learned? It was a real language that they had just never learned. Because he wants us to connect. God loves other people. I mean, I'm sure he loves the oceans and all the other stuff he created, but we're made in his image. So why wouldn't he give us the ability in the prophetic realm to have a prophetic word for somebody? Or a dream that represents something. It happened all the time. In the Old and New Testament, he would give people dreams. He's connecting with us. But if we're not connected to him, we lose the power of helping each other out. So it has to start here on this vertical. And I'm just going to skip ahead to end. You guys can stand so you know I'm not kidding because I've said end about 15 times already. I know how this works. I know how this works. But what you heard from Diana was really important. Don't you think? What a great name. New Destiny Family Success Center. Oh, that's a great name. That came from Carolyn, as far as I know. New Destiny. Christians have a new destiny. We don't ever have to stop growing in the Lord. You, you never reach a place where you've arrived. But this is to keep us humble. Back to the message again. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when, God, when you got called into this life. Woo! You didn't know me then. I didn't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential. Not many from high society families. It doesn't say not any, but it says not many. Most of us came to God when we were at a really bad place. Like we had hit rock bottom and we almost had nothing else to lose than to turn to him. But don't wait till you get there. There's nothing but upside with God. I promise you, there's nothing but upside with God. I don't see many of the best and brightest or the brightest and best among you. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? That was me, right? I was being played. I just didn't know I was being played. The very good chance that I wouldn't be here if I didn't get saved. Very good chance. It wasn't just that I was going to overdose on heroin or something. It was just the drugs I was doing was causing me to live a very reckless life. And you don't realize it because it gradually takes you to that place. And then you get saved, and it's like, oh, my God, thank you that you saved me because I could see exactly where I was going. And you could say, well, you know, if you didn't make such dumb decisions, it wasn't that. I was living a partial and a piecemeal life. I didn't have the tools I needed to, to walk through the crisis that I was going through. So I did what the world told me to do, medicate my pain. But the more I medicated the pain, the more pain I got because I was making dumber and dumber decisions. And I didn't have any way to resolve the crisis that I was in. Thank God I'm here, really. That's what the enemy does. The culture overlooks and, and exploits and abuses, and God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, because there's no other way. I tried every program to quit doing drugs. I always went back, because it wasn't sustainable. I didn't keep it, it was a willpower thing, and you're gonna run out of willpower at some point. Because the next bigger crisis overrides your willpower. He chose those nobodies <laughs> to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Both of those are in quotes, by the way. No such thing as a nobody. But this is what the world does, right? And not what we do. The king of kings washed the feet of the disciples, including Judas, by the way. That's agape love, man. You... You don't get that in this earthly realm. That could only come from God. That has to be the fuel, that agape love, right? Hollow pretensions of the somebodies. It's clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes, by, comes from God by way of Jesus, right? It's really easy. We were raised in a different denomination, and we were praying to a bunch of different saints for different things. If you lost your keys, it was this guy. If you needed traveling protections, it was another guy. I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about. I don't mean to be critical of anybody, but I didn't know how big Jesus was. I was calling my mother a Jesus freak. Why do you keep talking about him? What about all the other saints? You mean all those things that we learned didn't mean anything? She's like, sorry. I was the one that told you. <laughs> no. One. Oh. One died for all, amen? So I want to end with something good, that you're an ambassador of kingdom expansion. 
I, I just want us to speak a, a positive confession over who we are. And then when you sit down for food or coffee or if you get a chance to hang out, what does it mean to you? Like, what does it mean to you to be an ambassador? It's different for every one of us because we all have a different footprint. We all have a different place in life. And every one of it, us is important to God. Everyone. The guy that's getting the food is going to talk to people that we'll never talk to. Somebody could show up at his house from the state and say, what happened to you? You have a different a demeanor about you. I don't know. I just know that these people came and helped me. And I can't figure out why. They have no reason to do it. And that disarms the enemy. That's what agape love does. And we can all keep growing in that. So this says, now, now I send you to open their eyes. So I'm saying that to you all. Now I send you to open their eyes. Who's them? You're going to be at Thanksgiving in like a month. <laughs> Probably plenty of opportunities there. We have an election coming up. So maybe at the coffee bar in your, in your work and somebody brings up politics, woo, boy, if agape love was ever needed, it would be right then, right there. <laughs> I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. This is Paul talking, and he was talking to the, to the king that had him on trial. This is what happened to me. God told me he was going to commission me to be an ambassador of his kingdom. And he said I was going to go and open their eyes, turn them from dark to light, and from the power of Satan to God. He was going to give me this quantum leap up so that I could absorb more light. But then as I gave out the light that he gave me, I don't have to drop down again because he refills whatever I give out. Nice. So we just keep going quantum leap higher and higher, and the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of this glorious way to live our lives, to receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then this is the last verse. I promise I'm putting it down. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That's agape, right? We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. There's nothing you could have done to earn it. But he loved you enough to just say, you know what? You're one of mine. Come on in. He's saying that to everybody. He doesn't want one person to perish. But he uses us as his body if we're willing to be used. Anybody be willing to be used? You know, I'll let you out quicker. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for this understanding that, that there's a purpose. Like David said to his brothers, is there not a cause? Of course there's a cause. There's hurting people all around us. We don't want to be people in the lifeboat that aren't willing to go back and try to pull somebody else out. We can't be satisfied with the fact that we get to go to heaven when we die, but neglect the people that are out there that just need to hear truth, that just need somebody to show agape unconditional, God kind of love to them, and to demonstrate it in a way that just changes their paradigm of what it means to be a Christian. People get hurt in church. You know, you, you don't want to tell people that church is the answer. Church is a part of it, but God is the answer, right? Once you fall in love with God, you're going to find a church where you get fed, and then you're going to know that that's where God wants you to be. So, Help them understand that it's a personal relationship with a loving God. And when he dropped his spirit into you, he gave you the exact words to use in every situation with every person. But we sometimes just get hijacked and come up with our own way of doing it. And then, man, just the wrong motive. So could you lift your hand? Lord, I thank you for the ambassadors of your kingdom that are here today. For those that aren't yet in, in right relationship with you, we pray their hearts would be open and that they would receive you as their personal Lord and Savior today, that they would recognize this quantum power that's available, super abundantly above anything the world could ever give us, but that, that it takes a decision to say yes to you and to, to come up and say, I'm going to try it your way, God. I've done it my way long enough. I'm going to try it your way and receive you as their personal Lord and Savior, forgiveness of sins, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the power that none of us could have ever had on our own, full of wisdom and insight to know how to read your scriptures and, and live our lives in a way that we can love our families and, and be examples for everybody that, that we come in contact with. I pray that you would stir the hearts of people who don't know you through us. Do it through your ambassadors as we represent your kingdom in the earth in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we want you to know every church service, pretty much, we always have a, a, a prayer line up here. So you might be that person who's never said yes to Jesus that wants to learn or see what it's about. Your heart has been stirring. You can come up to the altar and ask people to pray with you, give you a Bible, help you walk through this. But then everybody else here might have a prayer need as well. Okay, so those of you that are on the prayer ministry team, could you come up along the front here? We want you to know that there's no pit too deep. There's no mistake so bad that you've made that there isn't still hope in God. Amen? Church, could you say amen? No pit too deep. I bless you to go. If you need to stay and get prayer, please line up in this aisle right here. Hopefully I'll see you over at the Recreation Center and we can have fellowship together. It's right that way, out of the doors.